Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. Today it is my honor to welcome a guest, a historian who's become world famous, at least here in the Netherlands. <laughs> no, but seriously, he's uh, been called one of Europe's most prominent young thinkers, and he's been called uh, also the Dutch wunderkind of new ideas. And uh, we already had the honor of hosting here, him here four years ago when we talked about this book, Utopia for Realists, and we talked about revolutions and work, a shorter work week, and uh, also the universal basic income. But today, he's here to talk about Humankind, his book that has been translated into 32 languages and that has the Dutch title, The Meis de Mense Deuge, which means most people are decent. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see if that's true. We'll discuss a little bit and uh, we'll also put his theory to the test. Um, something that I would like to note is that there should be somebody sitting next to me today, and that's Martina Barillo. She uh, was going to be my co-interviewer until she got COVID. Um, but the questions are as much hers as mine. So for now, please join me in welcoming Rutger Brechtman. Please, have a seat. Rutger, how are you today? I'm very well. It's great to see you all. Yeah, you've been here before, yeah. right? Um, I think four years ago. It was, yes, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. I was invited by you guys, I think a year ago, and uh, to talk about basic income. And I said, well, I already did that. <laughs> and it's like, oh, sorry, we forgot. <laughs> so uh, we have this one to talk about yes, now. Yes, yes, another one. Um, four years, long time. What would you say has been the biggest change in your life since then? Huh. Well, I became a father six months ago. Congratulations. So maybe you can see it. From <laughs> <laughs> um, and apart from that, not much, you know, <laughs> still doing the same thing. I think that's a, a pretty yeah. big thing. Um, now, you also fathered, we could say, this book, Humankind, uh -huh. <laughs> A Hopeful History. And um, so yeah. maybe to those in the audience that haven't read it, if you could give us a quick uh, synopsis, you know, what is it about in, sure. in a nutshell? Sure. So the, the short summary of the book is that most people deep down are pretty decent. Um, it's, it's basically a, what is it, 400, 500 page argument against what the uh, Dutch primatologist Frans de Waal calls veneer theory. This is the notion that our civilization is just a thin veneer, just a thin layer, and that below that lies raw human nature, that supposedly deep down are all these selfish beasts, monsters maybe even. Um, and in the book, I, I try to provide a lot of evidence from psychology, sociology, anthropology, archaeology, uh, to show that that's actually not the case. In fact, that it may even be the other way around. Um, um, so yeah, it's a ridiculously ambitious book, but just couldn't help myself, I guess. <laughs> right, so the main argument being most people are decent. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be talking about this word a lot, decent. What, what is that for you, human decency? It's a very good question. Um, so... There's a very new interesting theory from evolutionary anthropology that I talk about in the book as well, um, which is about the question, why have we humans conquered the globe? You know, why us? Why not the Neanderthals? Why not the bonobos or the chimpanzees? What makes us special as a species? And uh, there's one evolutionary anthropologist called Brian Hare who has coined the notion of survival of the friendliest. Right? That was actually our friendliness, our ability to work together in, in large groups um, that really distinguishes us. Um, in fact, that even for centuries, for millennia, it was the friendliest among us who had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation because they were better at cooperating and surviving in a very tough environment like the Ice Age. So I guess that's sort of my rough definition of being decent, is being generally pro-social, uh, of being, I don't know, um, willing to work together with other people, not only thinking about yourself all, uh, all the time, but of course, because that's also in your self-interest. It's one of the arguments that I try to make in my book is that all these big debates about does genuine altruism actually exist? Because, you know, when altruism makes you feel good, then is it actually altruism? And my view is that these debates are sort of pointless because um, wouldn't it be... Oh, horrific to live in a world where altruism feels bad, right? <laughs> where, you know, you do something nice for someone else and you suddenly feel nauseous. I mean, right. that would be really a, a nightmarish world, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think I have maybe a, a low bar for being decent, 
Um, you could, that's, that's one of the, I think, the strong criticisms of this book, is that, it, in fact, it sets the bar too low. So in one um, sentence, what would it be? Decency. It's like, we need to be pro-social, think about others, mm -hmm. and as well about ourselves. Yeah, and, and the, the willingness to, how do you say that? Um, to be part of society, to contribute something to, to society, to not just think about yourself and, and your own good. I think that's, um, that's very much a human thing and has been for a very long time. All right. So you mentioned altruism, and maybe mm -hmm. one of the most famous philosophers uh, in altruism is Peter Singer. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're familiar. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We had him here as well a few years ago, mm -hmm. and he, he became famous for the argument of the child in the pond. So I think you, have, you walk, and, and there's a pond, and there's a kid. You see it drowning. Mm -hmm. And what would you do? You would go, you would help the kid, right? You wouldn't want to save that kid. And now, if you imagine, you hear on the radio, there's children drowning in a pond in Bangladesh, let's mm -hmm. say. You would probably not raise a finger. I, I probably wouldn't raise a finger. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, you know, what, what should we do about that? Should we give every, like, we could maybe help these kids giving to charity or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Peter Singer says we should give everything away to charity as long mm -hmm. as we have like a bare minimum standard. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're indecent if we don't do that? Well, I think it's very important to recognize the limits of human empathy. It's, it's why I've got one chapter in the book about empathy, is that you know, a lot of people see empathy as the solution to all the world's problems. But in fact, as the psychologist Paul Bloom has argued, Empathy is very often more like a spotlight, like a searchlight that focuses on one specific group, one specific person. I mean, you can see it happening today. I mean, everyone right now is focused on what happens in, in Ukraine. And obviously, we all want to do something. And so you're like, okay, now I'm going to donate money to this or that charity. But the effective altruist, you know, Peter Singer is part of the effective altruist movement, would say, well, are you really sure that that's the most effective use of your dollar? Because if something is in the news right now, then there's probably a lot of other people's who, uh, people who are going to be donating as well. And maybe it's better to, I don't know, to give it to a charity that, that hands out bet nets because that will be more effective in saving lives in, say, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we should resist the, the temptation to say, oh, the human instincts are are by definition good, or, or empathy is also always something that we should follow. Um, in fact, in the book, I make the, the, the opposite argument, is that quite often we should be wary of our empathy, because the, actually the other side of the coin is xenophobia. There have been quite a few studies and many examples throughout history is that when we feel an enormous amount of empathy for one person or a group, it's often combined with, with you know, hatred for another group and, and xenophobia. Yeah. Let's talk about Ukraine in a, in a moment. Um, for now, so if, if we're decent, we, we don't maybe need to give everything to charity, but mm -hmm. um, we also do uh, indecent things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that you're decent? Well, that's <laughs> it's up to others to judge, but I think I'm a relatively average human person, so if we set the, the bar uh, not too high, then I'm probably decent. But Actually, writing this book has made me think a lot about how far you should go. I'm very fascinated uh, at the moment and have been in the past couple of months by, by the effective altruist movement, of which, which Peter Singer is one of the, one of the founders. Um, and what they say is, well, you should actually take it a step further and, uh, and think about, for, for example, your extraordinary responsibility if you live in a very atypical historical situation like we all do, in an extremely rich country, um, you know, maybe most of you are not yet, but at some point you will be part of the, probably part of the global 1%. Um, you only need around, what is it, 30 to 40,000 euros in annual income to get that. Um, so we all remember the Occupy movement that said we are the 99%. Well, globally, actually, <laughs> we're not, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're a very unusual moral position. Um, and so what does that mean? How much of, of your income should you give to charity? Um, I mean, I had that with the book. You write a bestseller, and, and then you're wondering, what do other authors do, right? What does Naomi Klein do? What does <laughs> Noam Chomsky do? What, what's your moral responsibility? Um, how much should you give away? 
uh, how far should you take it? And it's very, very convenient and tempting to say, well, look, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm good enough the way I am right now. Yeah, um, I did some research, I think I found your name on the list of people who give 10% mm -hmm. of their lifetime income. So what made what make you settle for 10% or like choose 10%? Well, I became member of a pretty fantastic organization that's called Giving What We Can, uh, founded, I think, around 10 years ago. And the members of that society pledged to give at least 10% of their uh, net income to highly effective charities. Now, in the Netherlands, the average is around 0.4%. So 10% is, I mean, it doesn't maybe sound like much, but actually compared to what most other people do, it is a lot. Um, and um, I think that you, you know, especially when you make more money, you have a moral ob obligation to go even higher than that. Sort of like a progressive taxation works. Um, uh, I think that, especially as someone who's relatively successful in a Western country, um, you have that responsibility. So could we say that? But the, obviously the question is, where do you stop, right? So Peter uh, Singer, he, he, he thinks, I think he gives away around 50% of his income but he still lives a relatively comfortable life, right? Yeah. So you could argue that he's still being selfish and he should go for 60%. But then, I don't know, I don't really like those debates because mm. I think it's already, you know, super amazing that he goes that far. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was funny that a few years ago you went to Davos and you called out the philanthropists, mm -hmm. but now you're also in a way, you've become one. Yeah, uh, yeah, but <laughs> some people sort of misunderstood my position back then. I'm not at all against philanthropy. I think it's pretty wonderful when people give away their wealth to highly effective charities. That's, that is absolutely wonderful. What is, what is really depressing is when billionaires use their philanthropy to distract us from their completely corrupt business practices and their tax avoidance and their tax evasion. Yes, then we should be very skeptical about philanthropy, especially when so much of that philanthropy is pretty ineffective and is mainly about, I don't know, spending on the arts or something like that, right. uh, instead of you know, saving as many lives as possible. Yeah. Um, so what struck me in my research on humankind is that, mm -hmm. you know, we, I think most of us would want to agree that, that people are decent, but some of us don't. Some people say, no, humans, selfish, mm -hmm. greedy. Um, do you think that maybe they weren't convinced because you, you use a lot of anecdotal evidence in your mm -hmm. book? Well, I think I have a, uh, uh, how do you say that? A double approach in the book so yes I do use a lot of stories uh, because I think stories are very effective when you want to convey a certain argument or idea um, I often find it funny is that people for can forget everything um, so for example in my in my previous book uh, which was one of the ideas in the book was universal basic income and I have one, one story in that book about um, uh, a small experiment that was done in London with 13 homeless men, and they had rec they received around 3,000 pounds, um, and they were free to decide for themselves what to spend it on. This is this really wonderful story of at least seven out of 13 of the men had a roof above their heads in a year, and they used the money very well. You know, actually they were pretty frugal, and if they spent it, they they used it on very spend it on very sensible things like a dictionary or hearing aid or whatever. Um, so it's just this one wonderful story. Now, if you think about it critically, it's, it's obviously pretty much useless, right? It's an extremely small experiment. I mean, you all know that the, what is it, the N is, is way too small. You can't say anything about human nature based on, on that one story. But what happened to me multiple times in that period is that I would go to uh, a birthday party, you know, and I always loved talking to strangers at birthday parties, and then they would say, well, what do you do? And I say, well, you know, I, uh, I'm a writer. Oh, what do you write for? Well, I write for the correspondent. Oh, I never heard about that. Uh, and so, what have you written? Well, this, that book, mm, don't know about it. What is it, what is it about? Well, one of the ideas in there is basic income. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, you should look this up. There's been a study in London with 13 homeless men. And so they would start telling me this whole, happened multiple times. And, and so they forget everything. They forget your name. They actually forgot that they read your story and then they start uh, explain the whole story to you, and they don't know that they've actually read, uh, read my article. Story stick. Um, yes, um, but obviously you have to go further than that. So what I try to keep in mind while I was writing this book is, will this hold up, say five to ten years from now? And 
there were quite a few studies that um, I found it tempting to use them. For example, there was a big study in science published a couple of years ago about people uh, losing their wallets, and that actually a huge percentage of most people in many countries bring those wallets back. Um, and I thought, well, this rather nicely fits my argument. <laughs> but I didn't, didn't use it because it hadn't been replicated, that study. Hmm. So um, I think that in, I think in pretty much all of the chapters, at some point you, you, you see me talking about meta-analyses, you know, studies of studies, where, we, where scientists have really tried to see does this hold up? Is it really a pattern in the whole literature? Um, and, and another interesting thing is that you start relying more on uh, research traditions. So, for example, I've got one chapter in the book about uh, uh, contact theory, which is a really old theory from psychology, right? It goes back uh, to the 1950s. Um, while the sort of the new fancy theories from psychology, priming, for example, well, it's completely... <laughs> <laughs> uh, even Daniel Kahneman says he's dead by now. Uh, right. But a lot of people wanted to believe it, and there have been a lot of pop bestsellers uh, about that theory. Right. Let's uh, come back to contact theory um, mm -hmm. also at a later stage. Um, but one, one puzzling question, if we think about human decency, is if humans are really good, then why are there bad things? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you grew up here in the safe Netherlands, far away from any poverty and violence. And my question is, do you think you would have still shared this idea that humans are decent if you had grown up in extreme poverty mm -hmm. or you had experiences robberies or rape, mm -hmm. something like that? Could mm -hmm. you, would you still have written the same book? Mm -hmm. I think my background has probably made it much easier for me to write this book. So yes, I had a happy and safe childhood. I have two wonderful sisters. My parents are... Awesome. <laughs> um, so, yes, I completely recognize that. But then, on the other hand, this is a book about a genuine shift in science. And so there are other books like this that have been published at the same time. The, 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 the most important one is uh, Blueprint, written by Nicholas Christakis. Um, you know, a much more famous and, how do you say that, <laughs> reputable scientist than I am. I'm not even a scientist. Um, in which he also makes the argument that something is happening in psychology and anthropology and archaeology, that there is a, a, a shift towards a more hopeful view of human nature. And that's why, that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to write this book, is that I thought someone should connect the dots here. Um, and sure, I believe that my background has made it easier for me to see that happening. Um, and yes, you have to be very wary of your own confirmation bias. Um, but then if I look at um, the readers of my book, uh, actually, they're, it's, it's, it's pretty diverse. And I, I also get a huge amount of feedback of people who didn't have such a privileged background but still find the book worthwhile. Also people from what you said were maybe not the 1% or the 3%. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. I mean, that is one of the most exciting things. I, I, I got a, an email a couple of weeks ago from a, from a teenager in Iran. And Iran doesn't really have copyright laws, uh, copyright protection for books. So there are three editions of my book in Iran, three different translators. <laughs> and they just like, <laughs> they just start translating it. And I didn't do, you don't even hear about it as an author. And so this, this, this teenager just read the book and said it had meant a lot to him. Uh, I mean, that's super exciting just how, to see how contagious ideas can be and, yeah. and can even be picked up in societies that are so radically different from your own. Yeah. So all of us sit here today and we're all safe and, you know, it's sunny outside, life is easy. Mm -hmm. But we saw last week um, Europe's biggest country invading Europe's second biggest country. There's war in Europe. And, yeah, if humans are innately good, then how can we explain this, this bloodshed? Mm -hmm. Well, people like me are obviously in a difficult situation. Two years ago, we had to become expert virologists, and now I finally am. Uh, now, <laughs> now I have to switch to be an expert on Russia and Ukraine. That's obviously a little bit... So, I mean, obviously we have to take everything I say here with a grain of salt and with what a lot of other people are saying as well. Um, um, well, what do you want me to say? I mean, there are, there are an enormous amount of, of examples that we've, that we've seen of extraordinary human courage and decency. I mean, if you look at the response in 
in you know border countries like Romania and Poland. I mean, people are sort of all yearning to be part of a solution here. Uh, refugees coming in, and there are thousands and thousands of people waiting there to help them. Um, sort of reminded me of the situation here in the Netherlands in, uh, when was it, 2014, 2015, during the so-called refugee crisis, which wasn't a crisis at all. It was sort of, well, if it was a crisis, it was an artificial, <laughs> politically created crisis. Um, but um, at some point, my sister called me, and she said, she was a little bit angry, and she said, you know, I just want to help the refugees, and I've, I've volunteered. But they turned me down. They said they already had too many volunteers. And later they calculated there were two, there were two volunteers for every refugee uh, here in the Netherlands. Um, so I think this is a, this is a very clear case where, you know, the human, there are so many <laughs> more people um, on the good side of history or actually showing standard human decency. It's just that, you know, the people doing the bad things, they have such an extraordinary amount of power. Um, I mean, I've got one chapter in the book about the corruption of power, and it may be worthwhile to read it again and, and think about what's happening in Putin's mind today. Yeah. I mean, it's not only Putin, of course, right? It's, mm -hmm. If we look back just at the past 70 years, you know, the Holocaust happened, mm -hmm. and Soviet massacres happened, mm -hmm. and Stasi Germany happened, mm -hmm. and the list goes on, right? It goes Srebrenica, it goes Aleppo, and now it goes Kiev. And that's just... Yeah, why, how, why does history keep repeating itself? Also mm -hmm. on such massive scales where hundreds of thousands of people start killing each other mm -hmm. um, if we're so decent. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have to come up with an extremely layered explanation, right? You can't just say, like, well, human evil exists because of this. <laughs> um, one of the things that I try to do in the book is to say, well, our, our simple explanation that we often use, um, human do evil things because they are evil. Uh, that became pretty popular, by the way, that explanation after the Second World War. Uh, I talk about William Golding's book that became a bestseller in the 1950s and the 1960s. I talk about the social Lord psychology. Of the Lord of the Flies, yeah. Mm -hmm. I talk about the social psychology experiments that became hugely famous. You know, Stanley Milgram, the Stanford Prison Experiment. And I think what, what these stories and studies wanted to tell us was that, um, well, things like genocides and ethnic cleansing and all these crimes against humanity, they're, they're not aberrations or anything. They're just part of human nature. That, that was what Stanley Milgram, for example, said. It's like, well, this could happen anywhere. You could just take a, an average American. You could take anyone here from this room and easily turn that person into a sadistic torturer, right? Uh, into a camp guard in a concentration camp because it just takes, you know, it's, it's very easy. And I, I, I think... I, I, I strongly argue against that idea in this book. I think um, uh, it's a much more gradual process in which societies sort of poison themselves. It takes a long time. Um, and at every single step, there are opportunities to resist. Um, so that, that's, that's one important point. Another important point is that very often people do bad things in the name of the good, right? One example in the book is, is from the German soldiers Allied psychologists initially thought they were mainly motivated by ideological hatred. Then they start interviewing prisoners of war and discover that actually most of them are motivated um, by the love for their friends and their comrades, and they don't want to let their comrades down. Um, and actually, the German army command knew this very well, and they, they used it. So they, they deliberately tried to keep uh, you know, the, the soldiers together for as long as possible, especially if they had been through uh, hard times together. Um, now, this doesn't condone anything, right? It's just an explanation. Uh, it, it, I think it makes it easier to understand why um, sort of normal average human beings can keep on fighting, because that was, allied psychologists were perplexed by it in 1944 and 1945. Why were these German soldiers still fighting when it was completely clear they were going to lose the war? Uh, well, one important reason was they didn't want to let their friends down. Now, I'm not saying that that explanation also works for, uh, say, camp carts in Auschwitz. Obviously not. Then you need a different kind of explanation, mm -hmm. which it, I, I think I would think focus more on selectionary mechanisms, right? We know that a lot of the most horrific guards were probably psychopaths, right? But if you create a whole system that selects for psychopathic traits, then... Anyway, 
libraries full of books about it. Yeah. I guess that's exactly my point, is right. you can't, cannot come up with a simplistic explanation like, well, humans do evil things because they are evil, right? That obviously doesn't work. You, you wrote about the shameless, as you call them, mm -hmm. that are often at the top of, of society or of political organizations, and uh, that we tend to follow them in, often into war as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it say about us as humans that we follow them over and over again, these, these ruthless politicians, warmongers, bigots? Do you think maybe this could happen to the people here, us hmm. in this room? Hmm. Well, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of historical work has been done on intellectuals, writers, poets, artists uh, in the weeks and years before the First World War. And many of them were extremely enthusiastic about the prospect of war. They thought it would be liberating. They thought it would cleanse society from decadence, etc. Uh, so this is not just something that people with too little education can be excited about. To the contrary, actually. Um, I recently wrote an essay um, that was all around about uh, something that Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, supposedly said. He probably didn't, but who cares? Um, so the quote is um, that we should never underestimate the power of a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And I'm obsessed, I was especially obsessed with the, the second half of the quote. You know, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, because I think it's very true. Um, the, the vast majority of people don't really change the world at all because people just desperately want to be liked. Right? We just desperately want to be part of a group. And it's very hard to go against the grain and to do things radically different. Right? At the moment, I've been, uh, I'm, 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 I'm working on a series of essays on the history of abolition. Um, and, um, well, I've tried this a couple of times, but very often if you ask people, would you have been against slavery in the 18th century or in the 17th century? Most people say, yeah, I probably would have been. Yeah, I probably would have been an abolitionist. But, you know, maybe, but chance is very, very small that you would have been because there were just very, very few of them. And for a long time, those the abolitionists that were there were really ineffective and didn't really change anything. So I've, I've become obsessed with, with this question. How, how do you actually stand on the right side of history? Because it's easy for us to look back and look at, say, slavery or or witch hunts, etc., and to say, well, that was horrific. These people were barbarians. But then the historians of the future will also look at us, and maybe they'll look at some of the things we take for granted today and say, well, that is, that is equally horrific. That is maybe just as bad as, as, as slavery was two or three centuries ago. Do you think, can you come up with something that we're doing now that maybe in 100 years we'll find it terrible? Oh, yes, yeah. Well, it's very easy, of, of course. Uh, I think at the top of the list is the way we treat animals. Uh, it's, I think that's super obvious. Uh, that I mean, just the scale of factory farming is so, so enormous. Talking about, what is it, 60, 70, 80 billion animals slaughtered every year, and the vast majority of them live in absolutely horrific circumstances. Um, so yes, I think that maybe our grandchildren, maybe the children of our grandchildren will be shocked that most people in this room probably you know, just eat meat from from sentient beings that had an absolutely horrific life. So if you do that today, well, and you think that you would have been an abolitionist in the 18th century, well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but there are other examples as well. I mean, the fact that extreme poverty exists. Uh, what is it? Almost a billion people in this world live in, in, in such horrific circumstances. And... Um, there are, there are different estimates. So there's one charity evaluator called GiveWell that has done super rigorous research in which they calculated that with around three to 4,000 euros, you could save one person's life with, for example, the distribution of bed nets or the distribution of vitamin A supplements. Um, and um, well, we probably, maybe not now, but probably all of us at some point in our lives, we could start saving lives, right? And um, we don't do that. Well, why not? Why, do, why, does it, why does that still exist? Maybe the historians of the future will, will, will be horrified 
by that as well. Yeah, and if we get back to to the war that's happening, mm -hmm. um, you wrote in the first pages of, of Humankind, maybe I can find it, you wrote the story of what happened in London in mm -hmm. 1940, um, in the, the Blitz, in the yeah. Blitz indeed. Yeah. And I think that you wrote, um, and I quote, it's when crisis hits, when the bombs fall and the floodwaters rise, that we humans become our best selves. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what's happening? With oh, absolutely. I was, I was in Kiev, actually, in October at a conference, uh, and I saw Zelensky speak. I was, well, I don't want to make this about me, but it is <laughs> sort of bizarre that I was five meters away from him, and we, I, I thought it was hilarious that this guy, who just, what is it, four years ago, was a star from a television series, Comedian. a very silly television series, mm -hmm. and that he had now become the president. And uh, I was talking to uh, uh, about it with different people at the conference, and they say, well, yeah, this is sort of the Ukrainian Trump. You know, it's the same process. He's, he's just a celebrity who thought he would be a good politician, and now he's here giving the speech at the conference. Uh, and now he's turned out to be a pretty awesome war leader. Uh, um, but yes, th this, this explosion of cooperation, this willingness to work together, um, it's, I, th I think it's pretty clear right now in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Also, I mean, if we look at the larger scale, the, the, the people, I mean, you mentioned people ha handing out aid. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you think that will ultimately weigh stronger than... than Maybe the atrocities that are happening right now that we're not hearing yet because the dust hasn't, hasn't settled yet. I mean, usually with well, war look, comes war crimes mm -hmm. and terrible violence. Yes, yes, yes. Well, look, in a way, I think you can say that, and again, I'm sort of hesitant to, to comment on it at all, about it at all because I'm really not an expert. Um, but what you can say is that Putin has almost already lost the war because... Um, I mean, you can you can sort of keep on bombing and bombing. That was the theory of the of both the Allied and the Germans. Is that it, this notion of moral bombing that you could sort of break the will of the people with with more and more violence? And the opposite happened. Um, actually, people were more resolved and and became stronger in their cooperation during those moments of crisis. And it seems to me that the spirit of the Ukrainian people is pretty much unbreakable at this point and that uh, yeah but anyway I'm still in, uh, incredibly worried I'm incredibly worried about about nuclear weapons as well yeah. um, I don't know it's weird it's so weird it's it's almost like we've stepped into a time machine right and now we suddenly remember oh wait a minute these absolutely super destructive weapons they still exist and they're being uh, threatened to yeah. be used as well. It's it's weird, isn't it, for for people like us? We're like, this was supposed to be over. We have these major challenges like climate change, the extinction of species that's going on. We cannot afford to go back to the problems of the Cold War. But here we are. Hmm. If we think about ourselves here in this room, do you think what what you said there about the best of us coming out in the moment of crisis? Do you think that's that we can say that about ourselves right now? Are we here in the room now being the best selves? I mean, the, the war in Ukraine is, is mm -hmm. a few thousand kilometers away, but it's, it's yes, in Europe. Yes. It's, we're in Europe yes. here as well. Well, it's the question, obviously, what you can do, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll probably have a situation like in the Spanish Civil War that some people from, I mean, Zelensky has already asked people from foreign countries to come over and you can get a weapon, right? Mm -hmm. I think I would probably stand in the way. I would probably <laughs> be completely useless to the war effort. Um, but again, from, from sort of the effective altruist perspective, it's, it's also worthwhile to, to ask yourself, what can I really do? What is the best use of my time, resources, money, et cetera? Yeah, so you don't think we're, or maybe let me ask you again, do you think maybe we're here doing the best we can right now to, to stand up? I mean, um, or, or are we just worrying about our own gas prices going up or our stocks falling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was actually pretty impressed by uh, the response of leaders in the European Union. I think a lot of people wouldn't have, have, have expected that, that it would be so, that there would be a consensus that was arrived at so quickly. 
And it's an enormous historic turning point, with the historic turning point being in Sweden, in Germany, you name it. I don't know. But as I said, I feel uncomfortable commenting okay. on this because, yeah. I don't know, it's, we're in the middle of history in the making. And uh, you say something today and it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's out of date, maybe in the evening already. I actually okay. saw an, an op-ed. Uh, in the Financial Times ar today that was arguing for sanctions that were already implemented by the time <laughs> <laughs> the op-ed was published. So, I don't know. Right, then uh, <laughs> let's hope that the war will, you know, not claim too many victims. And let's talk about something that we're more, more familiar with here on this room and something that's been going on for two years now. And, of course, I'm talking about COVID, mm -hmm. um, which is also a source of conflict, right? You have the vaxxers versus the anti-vaxxers, mm -hmm. you have the, the protesters versus the lockdown supporters and mm -hmm. the, the measure supporters. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was people insulting each other for having different opinions, yes. right? We saw a lot of hate, and I'm talking about both sides. Mm -hmm. um, we saw some violence even. Did we forget about decency during the pandemic? Um, well, sure, there are a lot of uh, examples like that. Uh, Especially in the case of anti-vaxxers, I, I agree with you that um, I, I recently saw a poll in which uh, the, the, the researchers tried to measure the hatred that people have for anti-vaxxers, and it's pretty shocking, actually. There's an enormous amount of disdain and dislike um, that, it's, that is completely counterproductive. So I don't know um, what's your experience, but... I haven't convinced many people in my life by insulting them <laughs> and by saying you're extremely stupid and you should adopt my opinion or my position. Generally, it doesn't really work, right? Um, actually, the, we, we, we vastly overestimated the, the amount of people who are strongly against vaccination. There was recently a study in the UK that, that I think the number was 0.4% of people who are ideologically motivated not to take the vaccine. The vast majority who did, of people who didn't take the vaccine, you know, just didn't have the right information, didn't have the time, um, you know, didn't see the opportunity. Um, they are from less privileged backgrounds, you know, in, in poor neighborhoods, etc. And, and people who, they, who, they who could genuinely be, thought about it and, and said, no, don't want to take this risk. Yeah, yeah, but it could be relatively easily convinced. So. Uh, one of my sisters, she's a, a doctor here in the Netherlands, and she joined a volunteers initiative of, of basically just standing on a on a square or a market where people could approach these doctors in their white coats, ask questions, and she said, "Well, did for one day convince ten people to take their shot." Um, so that and that wouldn't happen, obviously, if you're a determined anti-vaxxer. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in general, it's just very hard to convince people if you're if you want to insult them at the same time. Right, and I heard you speak in an interview with the New York Times where you were talking about of people that don't want to stand on the wrong side of history. And I think maybe you could explain what you meant with that, that a lot of people that are truly convinced uh, of that what they're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. um, they don't want to be convinced of the opposite, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you can elaborate on that. Um, I don't think I fully understand so, the so question. I think that the thought was that nobody likes to stand on the wrong side of history. Yes. People yes. Who, who say, no, I don't want to vaccinate myself. I don't think the, the COVID uh, virus is yes, actually there, dangerous. Yes, there are very few people who say, look, I'm just selfish, and that's why I don't get my shots. That's why I mm -hmm. eat meat. That's why I don't donate to charity. It's because I'm selfish, right? That's who I am. There are very few people like that. The vast majority of people say, well, look, I'm a generally good person. I'm not an angel, but I'm, gen you know, I'm a decent person. Uh, and there are practical reasons for why I eat meat because, well, everyone does it. It's natural. It's important for my health. And it's just, it's just the way it is. And that's how slavery was condoned for a very long time. Because people said, well, look, it's just, maybe it's not pretty, but look, it just, it's always been with us. Every society has had the institution of slavery. Um, it's impossible to get rid of it. You know, it's been tried, but you can't do it. Uh, and if we, would, if we would try it, well, it would probably wreck the economy. So, right? so people come up with all kinds of just justifications. And maybe some of these justifications are even reasonable. Um, but yes, in, generally, in general, we like to see ourselves in a good light. And that's, maybe that's also something I've realized more and more after publishing this book, and what partially explains the success of this book. 
obviously a lot of people want to hear the message that deep down we're decent, right? It's a very attractive message. At some point I saw uh, a reader uh, posting on, on Instagram, uh, uh, you know, in a very relaxed uh, setting um, on the Vlielands, you know, this island in the north of the Netherlands with a glass of white wine. Uh, saying, cheers, most people are decent, wonderful, we're having a wonderful holiday, and next week we're going to Bali. <laughs> like, oh, I created a monster. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late now. Yeah. The genie's out of the bottle. Yeah. Well, let's say maybe we, instead of thinking about how we can convince these people to, to do the thing that we think is right, but they think it's not right. Mm -hmm. The QR code is gone now mm -hmm. for a few days, so maybe we can use this moment as a as a turning point where we can maybe move closer to each other again, mm -hmm. and reconcil reconcile, repair those broken bonds. What would you tell to someone who has stopped talking to a friend because of disagreements on hmm. the COVID hmm. situation? Perhaps, uh, well, meet in real life, that's incredibly important. Uh, you know, our, our very bodies have evolved, obviously, for social contact that doesn't really work well on a, on a distance, we've all experienced that, uh, you know, in these Zoom times. Um, I think just some of the basic facts about our bodies are, are so fascinating. The fact that we are pretty much the only animal in the animal kingdom with the ability to blush. Uh, our eyes are unique compared to other primates. So all the other primates, they have dark around their uh, irises, dark sclera, as, as it's called. Uh, so I can see that you're looking at me right now. If you would have been a chimpanzee, I wouldn't have been really sure because your gaze would have been, well, more hidden. Um, yes, in a way, we've, we've evolved for this kind of face-to-face -face contact, right? And it's, it's much easier to establish trust in that way. Well, and then the second thing is obviously to ask more questions, right? Um, I'm not saying that I'm super good at it, but it's, it's one of the most important life skills, is to ask genuinely uh, curious questions about um, how other people see the world. Um, just asking the question often already uh, does so much in order to establish trust, even when you don't agree. Just the fact that you, you show that you're, you acknowledge someone else's position and that you're, yeah, you're interested in where they're coming from, well, it, it does so much in, uh, in, 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 in human interactions. But uh, I mean, that's, that's interesting about contact theory, the, what we talked about, uh, this, this very old tradition from psychology. Some people could say, well, this is, this is total common sense, right? How do you combat racism, prejudice, etc.? Well, you try to bring people together. And if they meet face to face and they, you know, do some things together, they, it turns out, well, actually people are, most people are pretty nice, wonderful. Well, do you really need like 500 studies <laughs> to prove that? Uh, do we yeah. have 500 studies? That oh, that? more than that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No, it's one of the most established theories in psychology, as I said. Uh, yeah. And so contact theory also involves this thinking in terms of us versus them, right? And if, let's say, our DNA is sort of, we're hardwired to think in terms of us versus them. Yeah. And our brains haven't really changed in 30,000 years. Do you think we can evolve to be more friendly to the others, mm -hmm. more forgiving, maybe more understanding as well? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to say that we are hardwired to be tribal all the time, right? Because especially today, humans have so many different identities and um, very often these identities are layered or they're even in conflict. You, with each other, it's, I mean, we're very focused obviously on the situation in the US. I think that often goes wrong in, in European journalism. That is that, um, because we don't read German anymore. It's, I mean, this is the case for Dutch journalists, is that we, we can't read German newspapers, we can't read French newspapers because our education was so bad. <laughs> and so we only focus on, on the debates in, in, in America, and then we assume that the same things are happening here. But the level of polarization there, and especially the way all these different identities have stacked on top of one another. So you, if I know that you like, say, this kind of sports, then I already know everything else that, that's there to know about you. you I know. wear a mask, I'm a yeah, Democrat. Where you I live, don't. et cetera. Yeah. And that's, that's, 
it's, it's, that's not the case in many other places in the world. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, uh, and especially, you know, once, uh, once people have a certain amount of diversity in their lives, I think that's the best vaccine against xenophobia. Um, but then obviously it has to be genuine travel, right? If it's just tourism going somewhere and, uh, you know, having a, having a good time and then going away. Right. But something like, you know, living in another country for a while. I think it's, a, it's an extremely valuable thing in your life. And it's, it's, it's almost like a, a s sort of a social vaccine against xenophobia because you just realize that the way you do things in your country, not, it's not the only way. It's not the natural way. Hmm. I mean, I'm not much of a traveler my, myself. I live in this provincial town called Houghton. And uh, I, I just, I don't know, I become very nervous every time I have to travel. So I prefer to stay, stay there. It's, it's a very boring place. You could die on the street and no one would notice. <laughs> um, wonderful. Um, but for me, studying history is a form of travel. Um, the most important lesson of history is that the way things are today is not inevitable, right? Everything could radically change. And that, I think that in itself gives you a certain humility, humility about your views. Because <laughs> so many people in the past and today have thought that they were on the right side of history and that their views were correct. But yeah. I mean, today there are, there are 5,000 religions, <laughs> and, and so many people believe that their religion is the correct religion. Well, what are the odds, <laughs> right? I was born in exactly the right society. So um, I think that's, that's great about both traveling the world and, and studying history is that if you do it in the right way, it makes you much more, uh, it gives you a lot, a lot of humility. Yeah, and you open your book, I have it here, with a quote from Anton Chekhov, mm -hmm. um, who said, man will become better when you show him what he's like. Mm -hmm. So do you really think that maybe by reading a book like this, by starting to believe that we're better, we mm -hmm. will actually become better? Well, you know, it's a little bit of a joke, actually, that I use that Chekhov quote, because it's so often been used by people who are pessimistic about human nature. I think Steven Pinker used it as well in his major study on war. Um, and obviously, I'm very critical of Steven Pinker's book. Uh, but their argument is that, you know, men will become better if we finally acknowledge that we're these violent creatures. <laughs> so I thought that I would turn it around ah. because our view of human nature can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not just about the science itself, right? It's what, it's what we assume in other people that we bring out of each other. If we assume that most people deep down are just selfish, then how are we going to organize our universities, our companies, the way we do democracy, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I think we're going to build institutions that will bring out a huge amount of selfishness. And I think this has generally been the case in this historical era that we call the era of neoliberalism. And that's maybe now finally coming to an end. You know, for such a long time, so many people have assumed that people are fundamentally selfish and built their institutions around it. And maybe we can change that. Right. I think this is a good moment um, to ask if anybody here in the audience would like to ask a question. Um, I see some hands, maybe the blonde young man over there. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, it has been very interesting so far. And we just talked about how uh, different stories and narratives bring the best of us. And uh, I would say, yeah, that good people, good societies spur from good narratives, collective mm -hmm. narratives that make us uh, see more long-term what is uh, good for our society and work toward collective goals. However, we have seen lately that we consume very personified, uh, individualized information and uh, very fragmented information that usually creates this um, enclave thinking of and seeing only the worst in other people. Do you think that there's still place in contemporary society for these big narratives uh, which make us work towards collective goals and if there's a place for them in contemporary society, how do we embrace them? Hmm. Hmm. Um, you know, when I was a, uh, a student, a history student, 10 years ago, I had to read all these books about the end of the nation state, for example, and that the end of patriotism and blah, 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 and that, you know, we would all go up in one big, I don't know, global thing. Um, and uh, today we don't really believe that anymore. I, th I think we, I mean, if you want to think about nation building today in Ukraine, I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily powerful stories coming out there that will be talked about for decades, maybe even longer than that. Zelensky saying, I don't need uh, 
uh, a ride, I need ammunition, or the story of what happened on that island. And you know, the first time I, I, <laughs> I saw that story, I thought, well, I'm not really sure if that really happened in that way. And I think initially they said that they, they were all killed, the 30 men. And I think now it's maybe they're still alive. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because the story itself is so incredibly powerful at this, this moment in history. So uh, I don't think any, any of that has changed. Uh, I think we humans are fun, you, we are a storytelling species. Um, so, um, and it's it's also the case with uh, some of the doom uh, uh, thinking about modern social media, for example, that everything is fragmented, that people don't have attention spans anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you can read nineteenth century social commentators talking about, say, the rise of the, the, the train or the telegraph and having these same complaints, like people can't focus on anything anymore. Uh, you know, they, there's no, no stability whatsoever in their lives anymore. I don't know, again, studying history is an, is, is an antidote against overconfident conclusions there, because many things that we worry about today, we used to worry about in the past as well, and often much more, uh, much more. <laughs> in general, uh, if you say it used to, it used to be worse, you're correct, right? So that uh, uh, mm -hmm. gives you some reason to uh, I mean, put things in perspective. There's, there's one thing that has changed, that has become worse, maybe. And that's that we live in ever smaller echo chambers, right? Oh, I don't agree at all. I mean, in, in the Netherlands, in the 1950s, in this, especially in the 1950s, we had the so-called pillarization, the verzuiling of society. And, you know, the bubbles were much more extreme back then. People were either Protestant or Catholic or socialist or liberal. And, you know, that you were completely separate societies. If you, if you bred goats, you wouldn't go to, as a Catholic, you wouldn't go to the, to the Protestant goat uh, breeding society, right? <laughs> but you would have your own society to do that. So well, you would, for instance, all consume the same news, right? So no, no, you had a Catholic newspaper, you had a socialist newspaper. Well, at the end of the day, you had the, the 8 o'clock news and maybe, what? Well, television didn't times, exist back then. Let's say in the, in the 60s, 70s, or just in the generations just before ours. Yes. And now we, we see, you know, people that com com consume completely different news as well. So yeah, I think it's a... That's more the case for the US. I think it's much... This phenomenon is lost much less pronounced in Europe. So, for example, um, a couple of years ago, there was a study done by um, a government think tank. We don't even have really have ideological think tanks, but just sort of the government think tank, the, the Social and Cultural Planning Bureau, mm -hmm. <laughs> about the effects of asylum centers on the local crime rate. And so all the Dutch media were writing about that report. The, you know, the Telegraph, which is a right-wing newspaper, and also... The correspondent where I write for, which is much more left-wing, so less progressive, um, and obviously they drew different conclusions from that same report. You know, I wrote a piece about it and said, "See, this is what I've always been saying. There's no impact on crime. You know, don't have to worry about that at all. Let all the refugees come, etc." And then the right-wing journalists were obviously saying, "Well, we read the report, and see, this is a huge problem. Crime has gone up, and therefore close the borders." And a lot of people were, were concluding that, oh, it's such a problem that we can't even agree on the facts. But I saw it very differently. I mean, we, we were reading the same report, you know? And then we could have a debate about those facts. In, in, in the US, for example, you, everyone has its own report and its own think tank and its own scientists. So, um, yes, I'm a little bit wary of importing all these anxieties from the UK and the US and automatically assuming that the same thing is happening in, in other countries, because I think that very often that's not the case. I mean, what we have imported from them is algorithms. The b biggest social media companies are American, right? That yes. We use here as well. And so it can happen that you live your entire social media life and you think, oh, everybody's like me. Everybody agrees with me on this issue. Yes. And there's hardly anyone who thinks differently. Maybe those couple of people. Yeah, on the but that's thing. always been the case. And I think that actually. We're, we're more open to diverse viewpoints than probably we were in many other points in our history. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ironies of history, is that the moment when people start worrying about something, it's also the moment when things are actually already improving. 
So, I mean, I've said quite some things about tax evasion and tax avoidance and certain billionaires and how hypocritical they are. And some people have assumed that, therefore, I'm very pessimistic about the fight against tax evasion and tax avoidance. But the opposite is true. I'm extremely optimistic. There's been an enormous amount of progress in the last 10 years. Uh, if you take, for example, bank secrecy in Switzerland, well, it's pretty much been destroyed by the American government. Um, if you take what the OECD, you know, the Organization of Rich Countries has been doing, there's actually also the status of the Netherlands, which is still a major tax paradise. But, you know, we, we are receiving a lot of, or we're under a lot of pressure now to, to make significant changes, and I've already made some. Um, Ten years ago, that wasn't the case at all, because no one was talking about it. And, and the biggest injustices are happening in silence, when no one's talking about it. So I can imagine some period in the future where we'll all be worried about animal suffering, you know, and that will be the main outrage. And people will be like, well, it's, it's worse than it's ever been. But then it's actually already improving because we're finally angry about it mm -hmm. and because there's finally a large, effective movement. Um, right. I think uh, we have one more. We have time for one more question. Um, maybe the girl sitting there over there. Mm -hmm. Is the mic coming? Yeah, I'm holding it up. I think I can't see or hear this. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So nice to see you here. I got your book as a gift. And yeah, it's like an example of someone being kind to me. And it really <laughs> inspires me to dig some history in my home city. I'm from Chongqing, uh, where it was bombed by Japan during the uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. So I also saw some photos and uh, which resonate uh, with this book. And my question may be like less at the level of the like, uh, like the larger scale, but more like down to like daily life and interpersonal relationships. Because I remember in this book, there is a chapter called um, have a cup of tea or drink with a terrorist. So this really makes me uh, think of like, so you're promoting certain values here, which are very extremely difficult or challenging mm -hmm. to achieve, being kind to the person who may hurt you the most or who you may hate. Um, and while in that situation, you still need to love them or to have a, like a sort of conversation and to learn something from them. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I would like to know like, um, then what, what, how could I extend that example to something more simple, not to have a conversation with a terrorist, but to have a conversation maybe with someone you don't talk to so often anymore, like your ex, who may be a jerk to you in the past, or, um, or like someone who laughed at you at school, at school who bullied you. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, like those kind of um, situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if you have any uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe we can even take it a step further. I've been thinking a lot about what my next book should be about. And a lot of people have said that, to me, that reading Humankind has been like a warm hug, right? Uh, it sort of restores your faith in humanity, and which, which is really nice when you're being bombarded by you know, a lot of news that makes you extremely pessimistic. Um, so maybe the next book should be an antidote against humankind and, and should, should not be a warm hug, but more like a, how do you say that? A cold kick in, shower. Kick in the balls, a cold shower, something like that. Something very painful and uncomfortable. Um, because the question is, how difficult do we want to make it for ourselves? Um, there are thousands and thousands of self-help books that will teach you how to live a, an easier life, how to get rich quick, how to make friends, how to be successful, how to be popular, blah, 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 blah. And some of those books are great, and most of them are worthless. Um, but there are very few self-help books out there that will teach you how to live a more difficult life, right? That will sort of, that you almost wish you didn't read it, because now you have to actually do it, and now you know all these things, and so you, you got to try harder. Um, and so maybe this is one of those things. Uh, it is indeed incredibly difficult sometimes to see the good 
and people who are so far away from you or are, or who have committed horrible things. I mean, believing that your friends or people in this room are relatively decent, you know, that's pretty easy. But now let's talk about criminals who've done absolutely horrific things. Then it becomes much more difficult. Um, I, uh, there was a, a documentary made about parents who lost a child in the uh, Breivik massacre, uh, you know, in, in Norway. What was it? 2011. 2011. Um, and um, there was one extraordinarily powerful moment when the father was asked, you know, don't you, don't you want to kill him? Don't you want to, you, surely you want the death penalty for Breivik. And you could see um, the difficulty he had in answering that question. But he said, look, um, I don't want to sink to that level. Um, I, I, I want to stand above that. And no, I don't feel any need for vengeance whatsoever. But it was very difficult for him to say that. And I thought oh, that was an extraordinarily powerful moment. Um, it, no, it's not easy. In a way, it goes against human nature itself um, to recognize the good, uh, or at least the fundamental human decency, or at least the worthiness of people who've done uh, terrible things or are so different from your own. Uh, but maybe that's what we got to try and do. So I guess there's another book in the works. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as we're drawing to a close here, mm -hmm. this was the second time you joined us here on our stage at Room for Discussion. Mm -hmm. You know what they say, third time's a charm, right? Yeah, so um, <laughs> let's, let's imagine you're invited back here, okay? Uh -huh. And it's one generation down the line. We're in the year 2050 now. Uh -huh. You sit there, and there will be a student here. And you're a grandpa, maybe. Mm -hmm. You have a big white beard. And the student who sits here will ask you two questions. The first question will be, now that we're here in 2050, what are the biggest challenges we as humankind are currently facing? What are the things that really keep us up at night? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, because my answer will probably be completely false. That's, that's, so, in, that's so interesting that's about okay. it, right? Yeah. That if you learn any one thing about history is that all these predictions are... Um, well, obviously, a lot depends on how effectively we, res we respond to the climate crisis. A lot depends on that. Um, Will we be at zero? That's zero? 2050, that's the goal, right? Yeah, ho hopefully. Uh, but I think people still radically underestimate just how difficult that is. I mean, a lot of people are saying now, let's cut off from Russian gas. Well... Uh, we're so, so dependent uh, still on gas, and its renewables are not going to cut it anytime soon. Um, so we, we have su still such an extremely fossil fuel-driven society in, in almost every single way, you know, how we the, the, the sort of the pillars of modern society. Um, plastic, ammonia, steel, cement, you know, you all need fossil fuels for it. Um, so, uh, the... I, I, I'm, I'm one of those progressives who still feels that people underestimate the, the challenge, even people on my side of, of the political spectrum. And, and what, look, one of the biggest tensions, I think, in my political thinking today that I cannot really resolve is, on the one hand, um, my enthusiasm for participatory democracy, for moving towards a genuine democracy without career politicians, but where basically everyone gets to have a say and... and Almost everyone has the opportunity to become some form of politician during his or her lifetime. But then, on the other hand, the need for speed. Right? There's a famous saying from Oscar Wilde who said, the whole problem with socialism is that it takes too many evenings. And I think you can see, see that clearly with, for example, the energy transition today in the Netherlands, where, yes, you know, on a general level, we're all like, yes, let's move to zero emissions in 2050. But then when it becomes a local issue and you... You know, you get a windmill in your backyard, then suddenly, you know, it becomes an outrageous injustice. Mm -hmm. And you start fighting strongly against it. We in Houghton are very good at that, by the way. Um, but it's, it's happening everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. This not in my backyard phenomenon. Um, yeah. So I, I cannot fully resolve those Let's, those let's go to the second question that the student sitting here will I haven't ask given you an answer in any way. No, but, but, but that's, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. climate change will still be an issue. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. I have no clue whatsoever. And I don't think that's even my job to do any predictions. Okay, let's do yeah. another prediction, even though it's not your job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you look back 
from then, 2050, you look back to that ancient history year, 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You look back over that generation, those yeah. 30 years. What achievements will humankind be most proud of? Well, that question in itself assumes that there will be progress and that there will be moral progress, scientific progress, technological progress. I'm fairly confident about, you know, technological and scientific progress. I'm not confident about moral progress. Uh, you know, we've, we've maybe become adjusted to the idea that things always get better, that, for example, the number of democracies in the world goes up, that poverty goes down, etc., and that even though there's still a lot to do, the general trend of history is good, or, you know, the Martin Luther King quote, the, the, the bend of the, what is it, moral universe, it bends towards justice. But I think that's a really, uh, it's a fallacy. There's, there's, there's no such thing as the will of history. History doesn't judge anyone. History is just history. It's just a bunch of facts. It's just one damn thing happening after another, as they say. It's people that, that make progress, right? And um, um, there's nothing inevitable about that. Yes, hopefully we'll look back in 2050 or 2100 on the extraordinary uh, accomplishments, you know, that we've stopped factory farming, that we've eradicated poverty, that we've done so many other awesome things. But there's nothing, nothing inevitable about, about it. Uh, I, if there's one main thing that I try to convey in all of my books, it's, it is that. Nothing is inevitable about the way our society is, is structured today. And we can all change that, but it doesn't ha happen automatically. It just starts with, with this. Margaret Mead talked about it. Small groups of thoughtful, committed citizens who wake up and realize, well, if not me, then who else? Mm -hmm. Why not? Let's try and do something. Yet your book is subtitled, and this will be my last question, A Hopeful History. So you seem to, to be a man of hope. Yes, yes. Are you hopeful, let's say, for the I'm next always hopeful. 30 yes. years? And there's an important distinction between hope and optimism. Right? Ho optimism is almost like a form of determinism where you feel like, oh, things will turn out to be all right. right? Optimism is, I think, a form of complacency. Um, or a way of ignoring also injustices. This would be one of my criticisms of you know, these, the work of the, the big optimists today, maybe someone like Steven Pinker, uh, is that, yes, you can, you can talk a, a lot about you know, the decline in poverty, etc., but we still have an enormous responsibility to do, to do much more than we do today. Um, and that's what hope is all about. Hope recognizes the possibility of change possibility that we can do things differently. Um, but there's nothing inevitable about it. I think on that note, um, we can thank you for joining us today. And I would like to ask you, uh, in the name of Martina, who can't be here, she would have sat here and yeah. asked half the questions. I have a pen here, and maybe I thought you could sign <laughs> yeah, her book. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and uh, while, yeah. you, while you do that, um, I just wanted to tell all of you students in the hall um, that First of all, thank you that you joined us here today. Um, if you like this event today, you might also like some others. We have, uh, only in March, we have the CEO of Rabobank coming. We have two of Europe's most exciting in investigative journalists. Uh, we have the former speechwriter of President Obama and National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes. And at the end of the month, uh, we also have Vice President of the European Central Bank coming. Uh, yeah, we'll be sitting over here. Hmm. Um, we also have applications open right now. So if you'd like to be an interviewer for Room for Discussion, um, don't hesitate to send us your uh, application letters. Applications are open until the end of the week. Uh, we're also looking for a new marketing officer. But for now, let's all uh, thank Rüger for his time. And, Cheers. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>